absolutely can. So welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining us for our virtual keynote presentation. I hope that you're staying safe, sane, and healthy during this crazy time. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Carly Silberstein and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Redstone Agency. For those of you that have been following along with our digital series over the past few weeks, this one's a little bit different. Instead of a digital round table, we've partnered with Speaker Spotlight to bring you a virtual keynote session on leadership and leading against the current, the secret to resilience and results during challenging times, aka COVID-19. Welcoming Tim Arnold. Thanks, Martin, and uh, welcome to all of you. I'm really glad that we could make this work. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting time in our lives and in our businesses, and I, uh, I'm excited about the conversation that we're going to have. I uh, spent the last few years um, starting to dig into research and writing uh, my next book and kind of my next area of focus, and uh, interestingly enough, it was the, around this idea of resilience and results. Um, I, I've been studying people and organizations that when push comes to shove and in challenging times, um, you know, when there's the option of just throwing in the towel, uh, there's the option of just becoming bitter, jaded or defeated, uh, they stay strong uh, for themselves and others and they keep delivering. Uh, it may be in a very different way, um, but probably in layman's terms, they show up well. And what's been so fascinating to me in the last few weeks, the last month, is when I talk to friends, family members, um, colleagues, business partners, you know, everyone says something to that effect. You know, I just really want to show up well during this time. Um, and I think the reality is we all do. Um, and the reality is not everyone does. Um, these are the times in our lives that really expose, I think, our character, um, our true values, and this reality of resilience. And uh, the great news, I think, and why I confidently believe it's worth some time um, spending together today, is that there's some things that we can focus on as leaders, as individuals, as family members, as business owners, um, that allow us to take wherever our resilience level is, um, to a higher level, um, to really make sure that the results um, that we're looking for are, um, are achieved. And again, they may look a little different than we thought they would have looked in January, um, but we're gonna be able to look back, you know, seasons from now, even years from now and say, wow, I really, I really showed up well. Um, so I'm gonna use this term leading against the current because, um, you know, I believe that all of us uh, right now in some ways are leading against so much that feels like it's coming against us. And to do that, I actually want to kind of just talk a little bit about currents and undercurrents. I'm going to uh, go back in time many, many years ago, actually. It was to the uh, undergrad, uh, my roommates, um, 10 years after graduation, my undergrad college roommates. Uh, we reunited for a week of surf school. So we were told that by the end of the week, we would all be successful surfers. So of course the picture in my mind was the picture that you're looking at now. Um, the picture of reality was quite different. I can assure you that, but it was still a wonderful week. Uh, humbling, but wonderful. Uh, what was interesting though was the very first day of surf school, we were in Southern California and just about to get in the water and our, our instructor kind of stopped us and said, okay, before you go in, I've got a question for you. He says, you know how the kind of current works around here? And he looked out to the waves. He said, you know that you're going to paddle out there and you're going to kind of ride those waves and that current into shore. And of course, we all nodded our head yes. And he said, okay, but here's the question. If the waves are always coming from out there into shore, it's always bringing water in, how does the water get back out? And of course, you know, a number of us were silent, looked at each other and he said, think about it, if, if your kind of conventional wisdom says waves kind of bring the water into shore, how does the water get back out? And ultimately what he wanted us to understand uh, was something that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but as a Great Lakes kind of boy, it was something that I hadn't experienced before. And it was this, this reality of a rip tide or a rip current. And he said, you know, most of the time you find yourselves in circumstances where you're riding waves in, but he said every now and then, 
what you don't realize is that you could find yourself in a very different undercurrent. And he said, you know, the, the water that comes into shore, it has to go somewhere. And what happens is, you know, as this diagram shows you, it kind of pools and eddies against the, the shore. And it literally forms a river that flows into the ocean. He says it flows perpendicular to shore. It goes against everything that you'd ever expect. And it was interesting because what he said happened to me once, and it was exactly as he explained. He said, you know, you're going to be paddling out to a good wave. You're going to lift your head. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize you're about three times further out in the ocean than you thought you'd be. And he said, Get, guess what's going to happen when that, when, that, when that happens to you? And of course, everyone said, oh, yeah, you just want to paddle to shore. And he said, but don't do it. Because he says, you can't beat a riptide. You can't beat that undercurrent. In fact, the harder you kind of work towards going in the direction you want to go, the quicker you'll tire. And you'll find yourself going further and further from the very, very kind of place you want to be. He says, you've got to learn to think differently. You've got to act differently. You've got to kind of, as this kind of picture demonstrates, pivot and really rethink things. He goes, you deal with that current differently until you get out of it. And then you go with what you know again. You know, you take those ways back into shore. And, you know, the reason I'm telling you this story this morning to kind of open up our conversation is that I, I'm going to suggest that as leaders, as business owners, um, as friends, as colleagues, as family members, we all face challenges. Uh, and most of the challenges that we face are almost like the waves. They're the things that we get. I'm going to call them problems to solve. You know, they're, they're problems, meaning that there's a solution. All we need to do is come up with the right solution, solve it, and move on. But I'm also going to suggest that as leaders, as individuals, as business owners, as friends, there's other types of challenges that we face that actually aren't problems to solve, but instead they're what I'm going to call tensions to manage. And here's the thing. If we deal with these tensions as if they were problems, as if there was a solution and once we found that solution we'd just be done with it it's almost like going against a riptide you know you, you know where you want to go but somehow you find yourself getting further and further from the very values you're trying to achieve or the results you're trying to achieve we have to learn to lead differently we and that's what i want to look at together today so just to give you some kind of summary of those terms and i'm going to give you at the end of my presentation a link that will give you the key slides. So if you're interested in any of the kind of core ideas, it's there for you. But again, problem solving requires what I'm gonna call either or thinking, either or thinking. You know, it's, it's this or it's that. In problem solving, ultimately, we assume that there's a right and a wrong answer. And you may not have thought about this before, but Everyone listening today is probably an expert problem solver. And the reason you are is because life trains us to be an expert problem solver. You know, the very first thing that happens when we're brought home from the hospital when we're infants is that our parents start to teach us what's safe and what's not safe. And you're like, okay, if I can just kind of go there, but not go there, touch this, but don't touch that, I'm safe. That's the answer I'm looking for. Well, then we enter the educational system. And, you know, in, in school, we quickly learn that for most problems that we have, you know, most questions, there's a right and a wrong answer. Things are correct or they're incorrect. And I watched this in my kids, even when they were super young, they knew if they could just choose the right answer, the correct answer, they may get that beautiful gold star. But if they get the wrong answer, there's that fear that they may get that awful red X. So... That starts to develop this either or thinking further. Well, then as we enter our teenage years, our family, our friends, our communities start to teach us kind of what's good and bad about a person. You know, you're taught morals and values and, and, and ultimately you're said, hey, as you enter into adulthood, there's paths you can take in life. And if you could just choose the right path, you'll be a good person. So what happens is by the time, you know, we enter the work world, by the time we're young adults, we know that if we can just... Every challenge that comes our way, if we can just choose the right answer, you know, we're safe, we're correct, and we're a good person. And this is good. I don't want you to hear me deconstruct or even attack problem solving. If we lost our ability to solve problems, we'd be done. 
All I'm going to suggest is that there's other situations that we face, other challenges that we face in life. And if we treat them as if they're a problem with a simple right or wrong answer, it will actually make the situation worse. You know, I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use a few cliches because they're things that all of you are probably familiar with. How many people here, and my hunch is almost everyone, has heard the cliche, if you want something done right, do it yourself. You know, if you want it done right, put your head down, get it done. And my hunch is a lot of you live from seeing lots of thumbs up on your screens because um, it makes sense to you. But I bet you every single person here also knows that two heads are better than one. You know, sometimes the best thing I can do is to get my head up. If I am in a situation of non-social distancing, walk down the hall, talk to someone, set up a Zoom call. It's not either or, it's actually both and. You know, I want to work independently and get things done, and I want to work collaboratively and learn and be better together. You know, I'll give you one more example based on cliches. I kind of go back to this idea of the secret to success, and, you know, Martin talked about my lack of hockey skills. Well, it's, it's quite true. I've never been strong in the athletics, and yet I can remember almost every gym coach that I had all the way through elementary school would tell me, you know what, Tim, if you first don't succeed, try and try again. If you first don't succeed, try, try again. So I would. I would try over and over again. I went out for every team until finally, grade eight, I had a gym coach. His name was Mr. Anderson. He finally had the courage to say, you know what, Tim? Don't beat a dead horse. This is not your thing. There are other options in life. There's arts, drama, speaking, probably not basketball for you. Um, and the reality is for all of us, most of the time, in, in, including right now, we lean on the side of just keep pushing, just keep trying, just keep going. But I know every single person listening also has been in a situation where you went, you know what? I got to let it go. I got to move on. I got to take a different path. It's not either or, it's both and. So, I mean, a, a quote that many of you have probably heard about before is this idea that for every complex problem, there's a simple solution but it's a bit of buyer beware because sometimes it's just a little bit too simple. And I believe right now in this crisis we're in, you know, it'd be great to come up with that silver bullet answer or to have a consultant or a speaker or an author say, just do this. But you know that it's a little bit more than, than one thing. It's a bit more complex than that. So I'm going to give you two examples of where I face these types of situations in my life, one at home and one at work. And then we're going to quickly kind of shift to you to talk about, okay, well, what does this mean for the complexity you're facing right now in this crisis? So I'm going to start actually um, by a dilemma I faced um, at home. So when my wife and I were expecting our first child, um, we were quite uh, taken back by the amount of unsolicited parenting advice we were offered. You know, I found that the moment that we kind of went live with the pregnancy, people came out of the woodwork with books and, and, and models and theories. They tell us about their stories. And this was great for a while, uh, but there came a point where we kind of went, you know what, this, is went, this went from encouraging to almost discouraging because it feels like people want us to pick a side. You know, I'd have people come to us and they'd say, oh, well, you know what, Tim, in, in terms of effective parenting, really, it comes down to flexibility. You know, you give me books on the, the Ferber approach and you talk about kind of how that little one is genetically coded to know what they need. Your job as a parent is to figure out your style that works with what they need. Don't try changing them. Be open to modifying yourself. And, and they back it up with research and stats. And that was fine until we talked to the next person. And, you know, the next person would say, well, really, if you want to kind of really get the parenting thing down, it comes down to routine and consistency and structure. And, you know, you'd give me books on the Ferber approach and sleep cycles. And, and you'd say, hey, do what you want. But if you don't really establish those structures pretty much from day one, good luck with the teenage years. So we were completely lost in this dilemma, didn't know what side to choose until we finally said, let's put the books away for a little while. And in their place, let's actually just hang out with a bunch of parents that we really admire. So we made this list and we shortened it down to a short list and we invited everyone on that short list to our house for a party. We didn't tell them why. So to our amazement, the following Saturday, almost everyone came. And by the time they got there and we introduced everyone to each other, we said, okay, gang, you don't know this, but you were invited here tonight with an agenda. So they're a little kind of weirded out by us at this point, but we explained to them our dilemma and we said, hey, 
for whatever reason, you're what we want to do more of in our parenting. So all we want to hear tonight, if nothing else, is just tell us stories of when you've been winning. Just tell us kind of when you feel like you've been at your high point as a parent. I don't want to hear what you've done wrong. I don't want to hear what you'll do different. I just want to hear when it's worked. And what was interesting is it started slow, but we kind of cracked some wine and things started to loosen up. And those stories then came fast and furious. And, you know, long after midnight, when everyone left, Becky and I, my partner, we were chatting about the night. And we said, you know what, a couple things stand out about the night. First thing is no one gave us the answer we were looking for. No one said, you know what, just do this. Follow these five steps or seven habits, which was a little frustrating because that's what we wanted. We wanted the answer, the silver bullet solution. No one did that. But at the same time, if we looked at every story we heard, they almost all pointed to the exact same thing. You know, whether it was one day with one child or years as a family. And that was people would say, you know, when on one hand, you know, we have had structure and consistency and routine. You know, we've had sleep cycles and, and, and consequences. That structure is important, important, but here's the thing. You know, what worked with this kid didn't work with the next kid. And, and you know what? What worked with that kid didn't even work with that kid the next year. We had to hold on to structure, but somehow hold it in tension with flexibility. Not either or, but we had to live in this place of and. And, and that really was the secret. There's no, there's no solution. Um, the reality is there's a tension that we've got to manage. So I'm going to give you one more example, and then I'll quickly kind of switch gears um, to your world and to your lives. But the, the example I want to talk about now is, is many years later, um, I was part of a small group. We were able to start up a, a 40-bed homeless shelter. So I was new to this. I'd come from corporate, and, and it was a new reality for me. But there was a small group of us, and we were you know, I'm super encouraged in this shelter to say, hey, everyone on this team seems to be totally aligned on our core values. You know, we had some folks from corporate and not-for-profit world and people with lived experiences, really diverse group. But man, we were all aligned on what we would have called our core values. One of them was this word fairness. But what was super discouraging to me was that even though I felt like everyone was in kind of alignment on these values, it only took a matter of days and weeks to realize that what one person thought that value looked like looked very different to another person. And you know how you thought fairness should look, man, I would interpret it very different. And although it, it felt on paper that we were all this kind of unified team, you know, when you walk down the hall, you realize there was a lot of division. And I mean, I'll give you the fairness example just as one because it stands out. I, I had managers, people who work kind of the floor, they would oversee our, our 40 folks from the streets and the volunteers and the community partners. And they'd say, well, fairness is consistency. You know, fairness means that people know what's expected. There's consequences. You know, fairness is that there's house rules. And, and that's ultimately how there's equity and justice and fairness in this community. And that made sense until you talk to our coaches. Our coaches worked with everyone individually. They got to know all of our homeless friends' stories, their backgrounds. They'd say, okay, but here's the thing. You know, what's, what's okay for us to ask of this person would be completely inappropriate to ask of this person. And, you know, based on the trauma that this person has experienced, or maybe based on a cultural difference, you know, we've got to have a very individualized plan. Fairness isn't that everyone gets the same thing. Fairness is that everyone gets what they need. And I found as an as a executive director that you know, we had these two camps that were becoming more and more polarized until hopefully similar to what we'll do a little bit later today. We started to realize, gang, maybe it's not either or. Maybe fairness is both. Maybe if we really want to walk our talk, we've got to get comfortable with this tension, this wrestling match between consistency and individuality. And, you know, all of this is leading to this concept. Barack Obama talks about it great early into his first term. Rolling Stone interviewed him and he said, you know, the issues that cross my desk are hard and complicated, you know, often involve the clash, not between right and wrong, but of two rights. And you're having to balance and reconcile against competing values that are equally legitimate. You know, it's no longer the simple problem where I can just choose one side. It's like now, man, I've got to get comfortable wrestling with what I'm going to call attention to manage. Not a problem to solve, but a tension to manage. And here's the thing, gang. If we're going to wrestle with tensions in a healthy way, we got to get comfortable with the word and. It requires not either or, but and thinking. 
You know, and sometimes in literature and research, these are called polarities or dilemmas or paradoxes. It's all the same idea. And normally we know that we're dealing with a tension as opposed to a problem to solve because it's a very complex issue or it's chronic. It just keeps surfacing over and over again. And here's the thing. If we focus on one value, but we neglect the other, it will always work against us. Even though we have great intention, we know where we want to go. If we choose one side, but we neglect the other, it will always backfire. You know, I spent a lot of time researching this and I know, I don't know everyone who's listening today, but I know out of all of you, there's tensions that you're managing regardless of what you do. This idea of how do we on one hand have a great plan, but also act on it and learn as we execute. You know, this right now, okay, let it out, let it out. I don't want anyone to, uh, to, to take it too far here, but you already get the idea. What you just experienced is kind of everything you need to know about how these tensions work. And, and here's the thing. There's always these two options, but each side has what I'm going to call a necessary value, something we can't live without. And you just experienced it. You inhaled, you got oxygen, but here's the thing, folks. If we overfocus on one side and we neglect the other, we will guaranteed lose that value and get its downside. And you just got that. All of a sudden, the oxygen kind of wasn't there anymore, and you're feeling this buildup of carbon dioxide. And what happens, you know, when we're experiencing that downside is we look to the other side and we're like, oh, there's the solution. You know, and you did that. You exhaled. It was great. We cleaned out all that carbon dioxide. But as you'd expect, we don't need to role play this. If you overfocus on that side and neglect the opposite, you know, within no time, all of a sudden you're craving oxygen again. And breathing is, is the example I'm going to go back to now as we kind of apply this to you because there's some tensions that are so critical that you manage right now in this time of crisis. If you want resilience and results, there's a few tensions you better keep your eye on. And my question to you is, are they like breathing? Do you feel like you're getting the values of both sides? Do you have systems in place to minimize the downside by over-focusing on one or over-focusing on the other? And here's what we're going to do. We're just going to kind of walk through four simple steps. You don't have to apply all four. Walk through all four with me, but you might just find that kind of the second step or maybe the fourth step, that's what you need right now. Go with it. I'd actually encourage you to go through all four steps with me quickly, but think about the one that you would say for you is exactly what you need right now. And don't worry about the rest after this call. Just look at how you can execute or act on that one thing. I guarantee you it will make a difference. So here's the thing. We're going to focus on the first step first. And it's, it's a term um, that is pulling from rock climbing. So I use the first step in leading against the current and having resilience and results in challenging times is that we've got to identify crux tensions. You know, crux tensions, I, as I said, I'm pulling from a rock climbing term. Um, this is an old picture from our homeless shelter. We rock climb every Tuesday. So about half of our homeless friends and a bunch of community volunteers get outside and just build relationship together. And whether you're here in the kind of general Toronto area or anywhere in the world, if you go to a good climbing area, Generally, you'll research it in advance. And then when you get to the climbing area, you kind of go to a really good climb. You, you know it's a classic climb. And you know you found it because there's lots of local climbers around. And you'll ask a local, you'll say, okay, I'm going to try this. What's the crux move? What's the crux move? And all that means is between where I'm standing on the ground and where I want to go, maybe 100, 120 feet up, there's a lot of moves I have to make, handholds, footholds. But there's probably only one or two that really matter. We call it a crux move. And somehow, if you can point that out to me, and if I can just put my energy on those one or two crux moves, the rest kind of take care of themselves. And, and it works. I don't know why, but it works. I, I only really have to focus on a few. And the reason I bring it up is that I studied under Dr. Barry Johnson, and that led me to do my research around this idea of healthy tension. But the research is clear. As a professional, as a leader, you're already managing a long list of tensions, a long list. I would say with confidence, at least 30 or more. And it's not helpful for me to say, hey, you know, here's the list, go for it, lead well. It's overwhelming. It's way too much to get our head around. But out of a list like that, there's a short list of what I'm going to call crux tensions 
in a time of crisis, in a time of uncertainty, in a time where you really want to show up well, there's a few out of that list that you'd better keep your eye on. They're the crux tensions of resilience and results. You know, the first tension that I would say everyone here needs to be focused on is not either or, but how do I be both optimistic and realistic? Both, you know, the, a um, lot of people are talking right now with the Stockdale principle. General Stockdale was a prisoner of war in the Vietnam War, and he was in isolation for eight years. He was tortured. He had psychological abuse, but he made it out alive. Most of his colleagues didn't. And he went on to become the first three-star general in the U.S. Navy. And when interviewed, you know, they said to him, hey, how did you do it? How did you not only make it, but thrive in the end? And he said, well, two things. You know, the first thing is on one hand, I had to be incredibly clear that there was a better future ahead. So much so that what I was experiencing right now would make this all worth it. You know, I, a, a interviewer once said, oh, so you're just an optimist. He says, no, 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 no. Because the people that were just optimists, none of them made it. He said, they would say, okay, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then Christmas would come. They said, oh, we're going to be out by Easter and Easter would come. And he said, ultimately, the next Christmas would come. And finally, they literally died of a broken heart. Optimism matters, but optimism has to be held in tension with realism. You know, Stockdale used the term, I've got to be able to face the brutal facts of reality and hold that intention with optimism. I've got to make hard decisions. I've got to get my head around reality, but never lose hope. You know, that's one tension. Another tension that's so critical right now is how do we embrace change and innovation when it's needed, but not lose what we're known for? You know, right now, the majority of keynotes that I would offer in the spring are not virtual. I do a lot of virtual work, but, you know, right now in this season, it's almost all I'm doing. We're in a season of change. We're innovating a lot of our programs. We're learning new technologies. And that's critical, not just for survival, but to really help our clients get through this. But constantly, my colleagues and I are saying, what are we going to make sure we don't lose in this process? We will get through this. And when we do, what do we want to look back and said, you know, levels of quality, levels of service, things we're known for. Let's not get this through this and realize we become someone different. We're still the same person. We're still solving the same problems for our clients. We're just doing it in a new way. We want to hold on to stability while we're innovative. We've got to do both. And the last one I would say is right now, a lot of us are really focused on caring for other people. You know, caring for family members, friends, clients, coworkers, doing whatever it takes to encourage, to deliver, kind of to, to show up well. But as all of you know, if there's a point that if all we're doing is caring for other people and we're not paying attention and honoring what we need, we're no good to anyone. And I, I as recent as last week, you know, I, I was talking to a few folks that are leading long-term care facilities in Ontario, one of them at a 40% infection rate. And this person was living in a trailer away from her family because she needed to be isolated. And she was working 16 to 17 hours a day, just trying to get through. And, and the question becomes in times like this, when you feel like your only option is to care for others, how do you carve out maybe not a lot of quantity time, but a bit of quality time. So I don't burn out. And it's critical. It's like breathing. If all I do is focus on one side to the neglect of the other, it won't work long-term. You know, what I would say to you in this season right now, going back to this idea of a crux tension, you know, I would say all three of those tensions are, are critical. They're all crux tensions right now. But when you look at them and even kind of moving into the, the, the other three steps of the keynote today, I'd say, look at the one that stands out to you the most and kind of focus on that one for the rest of my talk. We just got about 20 minutes left here, not a lot of time, but as we weave through the next three steps, we're going to go beyond awareness of the tension and say, okay, but how would I manage it in a healthier way? How could I elevate kind of how I'm breathing with that tension? Don't worry about the other two for now. Just focus on the one that you think for you is going to step up your resilience and your results. Because we want to go beyond just this reality of awareness around tensions. We want to say, how do we go further than that? And the next step is we've got to, I'm going to use the term mind our bias. So, you know, when you're told to mind something, generally that means pay attention to it. Be mindful of it. Don't let it out of your sight. And when I say bias, this picture kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. My hunch is that if you look at this picture, you saw something immediately. 
I think for some of you, it was probably a duck. You know, if you kind of look at the middle of the left-hand side, that's the beak and the eye there is looking, that's the duck. How many, though, I probably saw a rabbit first. You know, the rabbits may be a little bit different. It's almost like the head's back and the duck's beak is the, um, the rabbit's ears. Well, you know, hopefully by now, you can see in this picture, there's both. We've got a rabbit and a duck. But here's the thing. I bet you saw one thing first. You know, and this picture is in my first book, which means through the editing process, I've probably seen it a thousand times. For whatever reason, I see the rabbit the clearest. Doesn't mean it's any more right than the other. It just makes sense to me. And we refer to this as a bias or a preference or a point of view. And when it comes down to any of these tensions, even though on paper, you can see, oh yeah, this is true and this is true. Most of us, and research would say the vast majority of you will lean towards one side over the other. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, the goal is not to deconstruct your bias. And I, I would say our biases can really be our competitive advantages. They can give us an edge in life, in relationships, and leadership. Here's the thing though. Your bias or your point of view is either working for you or against you. It's either adding value in a time of crisis to those you're serving, or it's actually causing division. You know, I'll give you an example outside of the three tensions we looked at. You know, one tension I know every single person here has to manage daily is this idea of I need to be truthful, got to be candid, and I got to be tactful, got to be diplomatic. And whether you're on a Zoom call or you're writing an email, talking to your spouse, you got to do both. And no one here only does one, but I bet almost everyone here leans towards one side over the other. You know, maybe you're a little bit more of a, I think, it, you know, that the, the tact is the thinking relationally. How's this going to impact? How's this going to be heard? There's others of you that say, no, I always think about what do I want to be clear on? What do I want to make sure doesn't get lost in the messaging? And that's fine. You know, I, I would say personally, I'm someone who leans pretty strongly on kind of the truthfulness and candor. That's my bias. And, and there's lots of examples in life on how that served me well. I feel like I show up for my team, my family. I don't want to change that about me. I also know, though, that if all I do is live out my bias and treat that as the right answer, it gets me into trouble. And, you know, probably the worst example is I have written emails that I felt great about. I have pressed send and have been shocked at the outcome, how it was interpreted, you know, and, 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 and to the point that now, similar to you, there's days where I'll kind of do hundreds of emails a day, but there's always that one that you're about to press send and the back of your mind, you're like, ooh. This is a big one. This one could have ripple effects. So what I've learned to do, of course, is, is, is find one other person for that email. And say, I'm going to get one other person to read it just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. But here's the thing. Every one of us has what's called a confirmation bias. All that means is in life, once I have a point of view, I want to be affirmed in that point of view. You know, that's why right now, if I lean towards the political left or the political right, I'm probably reading those news sources. You know, if I agree with maybe starting up the economy, I'm looking up data to back that up. Or if I feel like stay at home longer and really value the lives, I'm looking for data to back that up. You know, we're, we're, we like to affirm our point of view. So what happens is I'm, I'm about to send this email, but I'm a truth person. So instead of kind of looking around the room and finding someone who's going to help me, I look to someone who shares my bias. I'm like, you know what, Martin, he's a truth teller too. You know, he, we click, we just do so well together. So I'll go to Martin and, you know, as a fellow truth teller, I say, hey, Martin, I read this a few times. What do you think of this email? You know, as you can expect, Martin's going to say, Tim, that's great. Well done. And here's the thing, folks. I didn't need Martin to read this email. You know, in terms of the rabbit and the duck, we both see the same thing. What we need to do is go a step outside of our bias and find an opposite. We call it embracing your opposite. Someone where you would say, hey, I know with this crux tension, I'm on this side. How do I make sure I'm getting information? I'm getting informed. I'm getting helped by people on the other side. You know, right now, I know that, you know, you all hopefully selected one of these three things as a crux tension for you right now. In this crisis, one that you just really want to manage well. What I would say is, Go a little further than that and say, okay, but what side do I lean towards? You know, in my organization, you know, the crux tension for us is this idea of change and stability. And I'm strongly on the change side. So I've had to go to my colleague, Claudia, and say, Claudia, I know you're a stability person. Don't let me take us down the wrong road. 
because I will just because I'm excited about it. I actually kind of come alive in these seasons. Don't let me do that to the neglect of losing what we're good at, what we're known for. You know, I want that voice. The, the, the thing is, folks, this is probably a better example than the duck or the rabbit. You know, I'll give you a chance to look at this picture. Similar to the duck and the rabbit, there's two things going on. Probably if you're like me, you see the face first. You know, the, the two circles at the top are the eyes and then follow that line down to the nose. But can anyone see the word in that picture? There's a word that you should be able to see as well. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange it for you a little bit because maybe this allows you to see it a little clear. Can everyone see the word liar? You know, the I's become the L, it's in cursive, so some of our millennials may not be able to read it, but L-I-A-R, liar. This is probably a better example than the duck or the rabbit, because sometimes our biases are so strong that if I don't seek out a different way to look at it, if I don't ask my opposite to say, help me see it differently, I just won't. I'm just not able to see it from the different perspective. You know, and that's why in the model, we refer to this as, Minding your bias, we do that by embracing our opposite. You know, whatever tension you identified as a crux tension, I would say, think about who is that person in my life, maybe a coworker, a friend, but man, if I'm here, they're always on the other side. And set up a call with them. Get them to give you perspective on what you're doing, how you're dealing with things. And my hunch is that they'll want that from you as well. So we want to embrace the opposite, but here's the thing, that's really easy to do. It's easy for a consultant to come in and say, hey, just embrace people who see the world differently than you. It's easier said than done. Because at the end of the day, when I'm seeing things from one point of view and someone else is seeing it, maybe from a very different point of view, if all I do is kind of treat it like a problem to solve, we end up in what's called a tug of war conversation, a tug of war conversation. And if you haven't been in a tug of war lately, they're not very popular in social distancing seasons. All that it means is that my only job is to get you to my side. And I'm gonna give it everything I had. And what's interesting about a tug of war is that if I feel resistance, it makes me pull harder. I'm even willing at times to put up with a little rope burn if needed, because I just wanna get you to my side. I'll give you an example of where I saw this happen. And this is going back a number of years when I was running the homeless shelter. In the homeless shelter, I walked into the meeting room and I realized very quickly with a small group of, of staff there, that there was a tug of war conversation going on. And what happened was there was a young woman in the facility, a, a guest staying with us off the streets, and she had decided to use a substance that was outside of our guidelines. And generally what that meant normally was that she wouldn't be able to stay with us for a few days. We would work with a detox facility through the hospital and she'd be kind of moved there for a few days and hopefully back with us down the road. And what was interesting was that if you talk to our managers, they would say, well, there's no question here. She has to go. You know, this is a guideline that we have. I've made this decision many, many times, and this is the way we deal with it. It's safer for her. It's safer for our community. This person can't stay here. But then a coach in the room spoke up, the coach of this young woman, and they said, wait a minute, just slow down a little bit. You know, when you think about how far this young woman has come in the last few weeks, it's been unbelievable. And here's the thing. You may not know this, managers, but in the next 24 hours, this young woman is going to be taken to a short-term treatment program, a drug rehab treatment. And for any of you who know kind of how that works, that's a hard thing to get into in Southern Ontario. She said, here's the thing. If we, we have her leave tonight, she's not going to treatment. We'll probably never see her again. You know, what's the fair thing really? And it went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until finally someone in the room who was actually a newer staff member had the courage to kind of say, hey gang, I'm gonna throw something out there. You know, first of all, I believe that this young woman deserves a better conversation than we're having right now. And I also think we deserve a little bit more respect than we're giving each other. And she said, gang, we know this, we've been through this before. There's some values we need to hold on to if we're gonna navigate this conversation well. And ultimately she took us to something that we knew, but somehow we forgot in the heat of conversation. She said, there's some tips that we just gotta hold on to if we're gonna do this well. First of all, remember when, when we're dealing with attention, and we know that consistency and individuality, that's attention. There's wisdom and resistance. When someone's kind of saying, hey, I don't see it that way, or hey, that makes me uncomfortable, rather than convince them of your point of view, know that there's wisdom that you may be missing out on. You know, the other thing is, right now we're focusing on our positions. She stays, she goes. There's not a lot of wiggle room in that space. But she goes, let's go a step beyond 
positions, let's talk about interests. What's behind the position? You know, the, the, the coach said to the manager, okay, you want this girl to leave tonight. That is not my position, but tell me what's behind it. And the, the manager said, hey, a couple things. One is I've suspended two people in the last week. How will I be able to look them in the eye if I don't do it here? And here's the other thing. You know, in our shelter, the, the drug culture kind of goes up and down. Well, we try to keep this place safe, but right now we're not in a really good place. Our, 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 we're not a clean facility right now. And I just want this, piece, this place to be a bit of safety and refuge from people who want that. Well, of course, every coach in the room said, well, we want that too. But the manager says, yeah, but you're saying this person stays and that is not my position at all. What's the interest behind it? You know, the coach of this young woman said, I only have one. I just want this young woman to make it to treatment. That's it. Well, every manager in the room. Um, what advice would you give people who, you know, leaders that are trying to motivate and, um, and like motivate their teams, I guess, when like it's, it's sort of, there could be days where it's challenging to be motivated yourself, if that makes sense. Um, and I don't mean that to sound negative, but it's like pretty wild what's going on. Um, and every day is different and, you know, everyone has their own things going on at home. So like, what advice would you give to, to leaders trying to kind of engage their teams when they're not necessarily feeling it? For sure. Uh, Couple things come to mind. I uh, appreciate the question. I can relate to the question uh, personally yeah. and through a lot of clients I'm working with. I think one thing is to do what you're doing right now and acknowledge it. Just acknowledge the fact that right now, this idea of staying motivated, staying positive, staying engaged is probably harder than it's been maybe in a decade for some of these organizations. And that's real. The, which means that we've got to work hard to tap into ways to try to get through this, cert certainly not with rose-colored glasses and pretending that everyone's feeling great all the time because that's not real, and to find ways to build that resilience. And you know, a couple things I'd say, and um, if you email me uh, by Friday, I'm going to release a little bit of um, uh, kind of next step help on this. But that one tension of caring for self and caring for others. Mm -hmm. is one I'd really spend some time focusing on. Uh, you know, there's the certainly a lot of um, uh, evidence to show kind of why we need to be servant leaders right now, how we should kind of lose ourselves, get out of, get out of our own head by serving others. Mm -hmm. And that's real. And there's a lot of evidence to say, actually, when we step up to look to the needs of others, um, this really interesting thing happens and that our problems get a little bit smaller. We yeah. feel like we're contributing. Um, but here's the thing, if all we do is do that, we're not taking care of ourselves. Right. And well, and, it, and I didn't say this in the keynote, but it's important to note that managing tensions isn't about proportions. It's not like, okay, I've got to take care of myself half the time and take care of other people half the time. It's, it's, it depends on the situation. And I mean, I'm dealing right now with a ton of um, healthcare workers and leaders of healthcare teams where it's incredibly weighted on taking care of others, clients, you know, family members, all those things. Yeah. The question then becomes, if I was to boil down just a few things that I need to fill me up, to encourage me, what would those things be? Mm -hmm. And you know, six months ago, there's, you know, if you watch TV and advertisements, people would say, oh, well, you need to go to the spa and you need kind of this, that, and the other. The reality is some of those things are great, but we don't need them. You know, some people, I just talked to someone yesterday that says, you know, I'm working right now about 16 hours a day. Um, we've lost a number of people in our facility. Every morning, I need 10 minutes to look out the window and have a cup of tea. Yeah. And that ritual right now for me is a ritual that I, I have to have it. And, you know, I don't think it's helpful to beat yourself up for being unmotivated or being discouraged. That's real. The question is, what are rituals that I can add, even if they're as small as 10 minutes a day, that allow me to get a little bit filled up again? Mm -hmm. so, so I guess the, the shorter answer is, I think if I were you, I'd pay attention and acknowledge that, that tension between self and others. And I would look for ways to kind of build on both sides. 
how do all of us become more servant leaders, but not to the neglect of acknowledging what we need and finding innovative ways to get it? Okay, thank you. Great question. Super important question right now too. Yeah, yeah. I'm finding that's coming up for discussion across the board when we run these sessions. So mm-hmm. yeah. Definitely email me because I'm going to have a bit more mm-hmm. information on that. And I, I'm not going to be ready till Friday, but I'll send it out to you on Friday. Thank you. We have a question that came through. It's building on what Bailey just asked um, from Cheryl Cottrell, who is a member of Women in Nuclear Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, she asks, how do we make sure we are making good decisions in a time when we have so many things going on and maybe are not in a good headspace? Are there any checks, checklists or checks that we can do? Yeah. A couple of things. I mean, one... Um, one tension that we didn't get into at all is this reality of kind of um, thorough process oriented decision making and kind of opportunistic real time necessity decision making. And most organizations have to do both. Most organizations have biases towards one or the other, but we all have times where like, you know what, let's just make the call. And then there's others where like, no, we need lots of time and research and thought and perspective. I feel like right now, there's a little bit more need even to shift incrementally towards, we got to make some calls right now. You're even seeing it in the government with lots of the plans that are putting in place. You know, people are acknowledging this might change next week, but this is, you know, Seth Godin, he's a great researcher, leadership guru. He said, sometimes you just got to ship things, kind of send it out there, knowing that it is the 1.0 level. Now, when you're in nuclear, when you're in healthcare, obviously there's the reality of common sense and safety. You know, we can't ship everything, but there can be times when we give our teams a little bit of permission to say we're in a season where we may have to go a little bit more towards this side. What I love about this question, and I think where you want to keep going, I would use language like, before we make a call here, what are red flags, measurable indicators? What are signs that we're maybe going a little bit too far that way? You know, and, and uh, sometimes organizations refer to these as early warnings. I like the idea of red flags because a lot of people just kind of get that. If we're going to lean towards this side, let's brainstorm about, you know, all, all red flags are measurable indicators. What would we keep our eye on that would tip us off that maybe we're going a little bit too far that way? And I, I would say that not only about decision-making, I'd say it about any of those tensions I talked about. You know, if right now, for example, In our organization, we're leaning pretty into the change side of things. So we've been talking a lot about what are red flags that we're starting to overdo the change side? What would be ways that we could not live there, but be tipped off that maybe we're starting to sink there a little bit? So I would say, first of all, acknowledge the tension, make it okay to navigate a little bit, be okay with the fact that there isn't kind of one formula for it. But really, I think you're bang on to say, let's get some people from both perspectives to contribute to what those red flags are. Great, thank you. I don't see anything else in the chat box. Oh, here's another one. This pandemic has sure a spot has shone a spotlight on areas where organizations have been stuck in old ways of doing things. Any comments on the appropriateness of doing some overhauls right now? Hmm. Versus maybe. That's a great question. I I do think it it depends on the organization. I I do think what's what's right now we're in a season you know in that change stability or evolutionary versus revolutionary we're in a season where we can actually under the banner of COVID strategy, take a lot of tries and not feel like we have to live this out forever. So if there's some things where you're saying, Hey, we've thought about maybe trying this, you can say, Hey, for the next three months, we're going to offer this service or for the next three months, you can work with us in these ways. And I wouldn't feel like that's committing you to say, and as an organization now we're completely new and different and overhauled. It's almost giving us a little bit of an opportunity to test some things out. I do believe, and I think, you know, as an op- optimistic person, we will come out on the other side. There is a better vision out there. When we're in a little bit more peaceful water, I think it's a time to look back and really do the postmortem on, okay, what actually should be revolutionized? You know, what actually um, 
should be overhauled because, you know, I, I think right now that's going to be happening with education. I think it's going to be happening on how we thought we had to work together. Um, I just wouldn't stamp an overhaul now. I'd be doing way more testing right now. I think that's a great Tim, answer. Yeah, Tim, I'll just say, I, I've seen you speak, I don't know, many times now. This is the first time I've seen you do a virtual presentation. So great the way you handled it was great. And, and it's amazing to me because, you know, the first time you introduced me to this idea of healthy tensions and went through and so many of them were relevant. And then the three that you picked, it's just amazing to me how it just kind of nails exactly what I think a lot of people are, are dealing with uh, mm -hmm. individually as well as organizations. So it's, it's just a really helpful framework and reminder just to approach some of these uh, challenges that we're all facing because it's every you know everybody has them and um you know it can get overwhelming so just having a way to sort of process some of these uh challenges and, and decisions uh is super helpful so i'm thanks uh, guys for doing this because i'm glad that i had a chance to just sit in as well and uh and uh and be able to participate I would say just as we close off, I appreciate that, Martin. And I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think that this conversation matters more than it's ever mattered. The one thing I didn't mention in the keynote, and I would just maybe have all of you think about this as we close, is the more you can get your mind around these tensions, especially those three, and know that they're not going away. There's no solution. No one's figured it out. That your job is to not solve it. It's to manage it well. You know, a term that I used in my first book was seeing is relieving and that there's a little bit of a, oh, okay. So there's not, you know, no one else has kind of got the, the answer. It's that I just, I'm going to be wrestling with, they matter. So I want to wrestle with them. I want to make these tensions safe for our teams to kind of talk about and work on. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of relief in knowing, okay, I'm going to just keep breathing. I'm going to just keep working and to say, hey, I just want to make sure next week it's even a little bit healthier. And next month it's a little bit healthier. And I mean, that's what I would leave everyone with is to have some grace with yourself, to not need the solution, but to be committed and resolved to, to make sure we're working towards a healthier place.